I'm Peter Henry, Vice Chairman of the Club and Dean of New York University's Leonard and Stern School of Business. The Economic Club of New York is the nation's leading nonpartisan forum for speeches on economic, social, and political issues. More than 1,000 prominent guest speakers have appeared before the club over the last century and have established a strong tradition of excellence. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the now 252 club members of the Centennial Society who are seated at the Centennial tables up front. Each of these individuals has made a one-time donation of $10,000 to the Centennial Fund, which serves as the financial backbone of the club. Thank you for your support of the club. And a special welcome to the members of the 2017 ECNY Pilot Class of Fellows who are here with us today. We're also pleased to welcome the students from the New York University Stern School of Business who are present as well. And now, it's an honor for me to introduce Secretary Steven Turner Mnuchin, who was sworn in as the 77th Secretary of the Treasury on February 13th, 2017. As Secretary of the Treasury, Mr. Mnuchin is responsible for the executive branch agency whose mission is to maintain a strong economy, foster economic growth, and create job opportunities by promoting the conditions that enable prosperity and stability at home and abroad. He's also responsible for strengthening national security by combating economic threats and protecting the integrity of our financial system as well as managing the US government's finances. Prior to his confirmation, Secretary Mnuchin was finance chairman for Donald J. Trump for president. In this role, he spent the last year traveling with the president. He met with hundreds of business leaders. He also served as a senior economic advisor to the president in crafting his economic positions and economic speeches. Prior to his confirmation, he also served as founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of Dune Capital Management. He also founded One West Bank Group, LLC, and served as, as its chairman and chief executive officer until its sale to CIT Group Incorporated, which was the first bank merger over $50 billion post the financial crisis. Earlier in his career, Secretary Mnuchin worked at the Goldman Sachs Group Incorporated, where he was a partner and served as chief information officer. He has extensive experience in global financial markets and oversaw trading in US government securities, mortgages, money markets, and municipal bonds. Secretary Mnuchin is committed to philanthropic activities and previously served as a member of the boards of the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, the Whitney Museum of Art, the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden on the Mall, the UCLA Health System Board, the New York Presbyterian Hospital Board, and the Los Angeles Police Foundation. He was born and raised right here in New York City and holds a bachelor's degree from Yale University. Today's format will be a fireside chat and club board member and Fox Business Network anchor and global markets editor, Maria Barroa, will be the interviewer today. As a reminder, this event is on the record for the media and is being live streamed. Secretary Mnuchin and Maria, the floor is yours. Please welcome them. <laughs> Great to see everybody. Thank you so much, Secretary, for sitting down with us. Thank you. Congratulations to you, first off. You said you wanted to have a major piece of legislation in year one, and it looks like you are doing that. Here we are watching tax reform uh, getting worked on. Can you give us a status check? Where is the tax package at this point? Sure, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be here today, uh, and thank you for interviewing me. This is obviously an iconic place to come and talk about tax reform. It was 1962 that President Kennedy was here talking about tax reform at the New York Economic Club, and it was a little bit over a year ago that uh, I was here where John Paulson interviewed uh, then candidate Trump, now President Trump, uh, on, on one of his major uh, two speeches on economic policy. So it's absolutely great to be here with you. Um, we're excited about where we are. The House has released its bill. Um, it's going through the process, uh, through committee and down to the floor. And later today, I expect the Senate to release its bill. I had the opportunity to meet with the Finance Committee last night, go through uh, some of their final thinking. I think that uh, they're fundamentally the two bills are very similar. There are some differences to the bill, but uh, I think this is a terrific process. It will be released at committee. They'll be going through a committee process, and uh, our objective is to get this to the President to sign in December. 
would you be comfortable with phasing in the 20% corporate rate uh, over a year, which is what is being talked about out of the Senate bill? So I think this, a lot of this has to do with the math of reconciliation. So uh, as I like to say, there's, there's a lot of things that are much more similar in business and Washington than Washington wants you to believe. But uh, the, the, the budget process is something that is quite different. And we obviously have a trillion and a half dollars to use in, in reconciliation. Now, as I've kind of described the math, there's 500 billion difference between policy and baseline. So we think that we should be comparing this to the policy, not the baseline. That takes it down to a trillion. And if you've heard me say, we think we're going to pay for this with $2 trillion of growth. Uh, some people have questioned my growth assumptions. But even if you get to 40 basis points of additional GDP growth, you break even. So the phase in, I mean, I'm giving you the longer answer to this. Uh, the president would like this to go into effect right away. Uh, I think the sooner we get this, uh, the 20 percent rate, it's the better it is for the economy. But the House and Senate are having to look at how we pay for all of this, uh, including a major focus of the president is middle income tax cuts. So th these, are, these are things that are still being discussed. Obviously, right away is better than a year, but a year is better than obviously a longer phase. In. Because, uh, I mean, would that have an impact on business if it's a year phase in? Maybe that year people can plan what's to come in, in 2019. I mean, obviously the speculation initially was that it would be phased in over five years. So this is a real improvement if it's actually one year. Well, Maria, one, what are the incentives, even if there is a year phase in, is if we have the automatic expensing right away, and particularly if there's a higher tax rate, that's going to be a huge incentive for businesses to invest right away. So I'm confident wherever we get on the exact when it's in, the, the most important thing is that we end up with a competitive business tax system. I think, as you now know, we have one of the highest tax rates in the world. We tax on worldwide income. We have this crazy concept of deferral. If you leave your profits offshore, you don't pay taxes. So it's not a surprise we have trillion dollars offshore. So the most important issue is that we convert from a worldwide to a territorial system and we get a competitive rate. There was a lot of discussion, debate, upset, frankly, about the House's bill and this so-called bubble rate, 45.6% for a portion of people's income. People say that that means some people, many people, are getting a tax increase out of this plan. Well, uh, for, for this, this group in New York, and I've heard this from plenty of people, uh, including the president, he, he will have a tax increase. So for people who make over a million dollars uh, in the high tax states, there will be a tax increase. Now, the bubble rate is you know, a technicality we're trying to work through. But uh, the president's focus is this is on a middle income tax cut. This is about businesses being competitive. Obviously, people in this room will benefit from the business tax. But uh, this is not about tax cuts for the rich. Let me, let me ask you about that, because you, you, you bring up New York and, of course, the elimination of the deduction, the, the state and local income uh, deduction. People in this room are saying, you know what? New York is a donor state. They pay $48 billion more than what they get back. Why are you raising taxes by eliminating this deduction on a donor state that's actually paying more than it should anyway? It's a good question, Maria. And uh, obviously, I just, I, 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 I just came back from California, where there were very similar comments. Um, so first, let me comment on the concept of a donor state. We have a tax system where the rich people pay higher tax rates and a majority of the tax is collected from high earners. So to the extent that a state has more wealthy people, which New York and California does, there's a lot more tax revenues coming from the state. So I, I don't think this is a question about whether it's a donor state or not a donor state. I think fundamentally we believe the federal government should get out of the business of subsidizing state taxes, and that's the reason to do it. We're getting rid of the AMT for a lot of people in New York. They do pay the AMT, so that is an, an, an offset. Uh, and you know, we, we've run a lot of numbers. We're very sensitive to people who make two and three hundred thousand dollars that they're going to get a tax cut in New York. 
Um, you know, as I said, uh, this room, people have done very well for the last eight years. This is really focused on the American worker who has had no wage increases for the last eight years. Is there any wiggle room on that, in your view, in terms of putting a cap on income? So those people who make $300,000, $400,000 a year, maybe they can still deduct that state and local, but maybe over a million you can't. Are you still working on that, and is there room for wiggle there? Um, I, you know, the House has a version. My expectation is the House version will get passed. We'll see what the Senate comes out with. There's still discussion, but again, I'd say on the House version, they added a deduction for real estate taxes. That was something we were very focused on for the middle class. But uh, I can assure you, I've had a lot of conversations with people. I specifically went to California to talk about tax reform. I was at the Reagan Library on Sunday night, which uh, was, again, another iconic location to talk about taxes. They got me on the road going to New Jersey next week, which is another one of these states. So we continue to have these conversations. So you're hearing it from all these states, that's for sure. Let me ask you, do you expect behavior to change as a result of this elimination in the deduction? You know, a real estate developer that I was speaking with recently said he's expecting a mass exodus out of New York, that people are going to say to themselves, look, I'm, when I counter, you know, local, state, I'm at 53%, my tax rate. Why shouldn't I go to Florida and be at 25%? So will we see movement, people moving out of New York, if they're losing that deduction and the local and state taxes stay the same? Maria, I've, I've heard these issues for a long period of time. So as you know, I've, I've lived in New York most of my life. I never thought I could move anywhere outside New York City and have a higher tax rate. And I did that <laughs> by going California. to California. Um, you know, I, I know in New York, when I was at Goldman Sachs, we had lots of discussions about New York versus New Jersey and tax rates. Um, I've, I've heard this in California. I've heard this here. Look, I'm, I'm surprised. Some businesses move and a lot don't. I do hope that uh, this sends a message to the state governments that perhaps they should try to get their budgets in line. And the question is, why do you need 13 or 14 percent state taxes? I want to ask you about spending on the federal level as well, but let me, let me stay on this idea that we're going to see some moderate changes coming out of the Senate bill. There's an expectation that the highest rate goes from 39.6% to 37%. Would you be comfortable with something like that? Um, I'm not going to comment on the specifics because it hasn't been released yet. Uh, so, you know, again, there's, there's discussions about the top rate. Uh, again, I'd prefer not to comment on that until after the Senate comes out with their plan. The corporate move down to 20% from 35% seems to be one of the pieces of this plan that you believe will really move the needle on, on economic growth. Talk to us about that. Why do you think that's going to dictate behavior on the part of managers and CEOs that they're going to take that extra savings and create jobs? Connect the dots. How do you expect them to change behavior? Maybe they'll just take that extra money and buy back stock and, and do dividends. Well, Maria, as you know, I, I had the opportunity to travel on the campaign with the president last year and literally met with hundreds, if not thousands, of business people, uh, big business, small business. And the two things we heard on the campaign were regulations and taxes. And uh, the president is 100 percent convinced, as am I, that if we give U.S. business a fair, level playing field, that we can compete better than anybody on the world. And when you have a tax system that incentivizes moving jobs offshore, that's not consistent with what we want to do. And th this is all about bringing jobs back here and making this competitive. I think, as you know, on the campaign, the president wanted to have a 15 percent rate. Uh, we started a 15 percent rate. Uh, the president got comfortable that 20 percent was the right balance of what we could afford and an incentive. But uh, we're sticking with the 20 percent. That's critical. Okay, the 20% rate is critical, even if it's a year later. Uh, again, we'd rather it sooner, but we'll work with the House and Senate on the rollout of that. So, so when, you, when you look at what's going on in terms of business right now, we've seen a real recession in terms of business. They've been sitting on cash. And you think that they will use this extra money uh, 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 from the tax cut plan and say, okay, now I can actually put this money to work in terms of buying you know, investing as well as creating jobs. That's what I'm trying to understand, how you get to job creation. Sure. Well, I mean, there's, there's no question. There's trillions of dollars sitting offshore. 
on the international system. So when we have deemed repatriation and they pay a one-time fee, uh, they're going to bring back the cash. That there's no question about. When we create a level playing field that our tax system makes sense and is competitive worth to the rest of the world, uh, we think combined with expensing, that money will be invested here. And, and let me just also comment on, you know, we're going to have tax relief for pass-throughs. So most small and medium-sized businesses are structured as S-corps, partnerships, LLCs. And this is about creating tax relief for small business as well. Why was it important to do a 25% rate on pass-throughs, but a 20% rate on corporate? Why not the same? Well, if, you, if you're a corporation and you dividend out your money, you, the, you, there's a dividend tax. So they're, they're not exactly equivalent in looking at pass-throughs, which doesn't have double taxation. You've said in the past you think that the repatriation part of this needs to be permanent. You, you want to see companies know that they will be able to bring that money back and have an attractive rate and then not pay double taxation, which has been the case. Will all of this be permanent? Um, there's no question, it is our intention that the business side has to be permanent. And again, this is if we do it under reconciliation, there's something called the Byrd Rule in the Senate to, to make it permanent. And that's how you look at the, the, what happens after the 10th year. So yes, it's absolutely critical. You can't have a system where you change from a worldwide to a territorial, and then 10 years later you say, we're going to change back. So the House has phased out some of the middle income issues. Again, my expectation is that those get extended, and that's the way we're looking at it. But again, some of that is just for scoring purposes. The, the rules around reconciliation are complex. Uh, in, in terms of what, what you need to be, where you need to be, it's one and a half trillion dollars that you're sort of confined in. That's, that's what you have to make the numbers, correct? That is correct. Yeah, okay, so in, in terms of where the money comes from to pay for it, you've said in the past that one move, one percentage move in GDP is equivalent to two and a half trillion dollars. Remember that's the president correct. said that. But that's correct. Two and a half trillion dollars. So where would you see the best case scenario in terms of growth? You're, you're talking about two and a half trillion dollars equivalent to one point in GDP. Could we go see a move in two points in GDP in the, in the coming years? I'd say I'm very comfortable with that we can get up to sustained GDP of 3% or higher. Now again, we've had some, level, some quarters of 3% now, which is the first we've had in a very long period of time. The scoring off of the CBO is off of like a 2.1, 2.2. So I'm very comfortable we're going to get to 3%, and that's what we're scoring this off of. The president is confident we're going to get higher. S&P yesterday was talking about the potential of a recession, basically saying a recession happens every eight years. And one of our members had a, had a question for you earlier, and that is about the interest uh, tied to EBITDA. So if you're capping interest in this plan at 30% of EBITDA, what happens when, uh, when things slow down? What if we were to have a recession? Your, your uh, you know, EBITDA goes down, but your interest doesn't. So let me just comment that first of all, um, there's a lot of companies that will still be able to have 100% deductibility of interest. So pass-throughs will have deductibility, real estate, utilities, there's areas that, are, that have permanent, uh, that that's important for. So what we're basically talking about is C-Corps, and they're getting the benefit of the 20% rate. Now when we spoke to lots and lots of CEOs across lots of in industries, and we asked them, Tell us what you, how you feel about the rate, how you feel about expensing, and how you feel about interest deductibility. The number one thing that everybody said that was consistent is get us as low a rate as possible. And if you get us that, we're comfortable giving up some things on the other. So to get to the 20% and pay for that, we've done expensing for five years, not permanent. And we have a slight haircut on interest deductibility. So, that's kind of where we ended up. A lot of people over the last several years have looked at carried interest and said this is really not fair where a hedge fund manager or a real estate person could actually look at their revenue and, 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 treat, uh, and, and, and treat ordinary income as if it were capital gains. Are there going to be any changes on carried interest? I'm sure there's nobody in this room that cares at all about this <laughs> That's topic. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> So I like to say, this is a, uh, this is a highly 
interesting issue to a very small part of the population. Now, the president said on the campaign that he wanted to change the rules for hedge funds and carried interest. The House has proposed going to a three-year holding period. I think that's a big step in the right direction. I would just also comment that uh, when you look at carried interest, two-thirds of this is actually in real estate. Only a third of it is in uh, private equity and venture capital and other areas. A lot of this is about small developments. But I, I think it's a big step in the right direction, and we're working with the House and Senate on that. So we could see more changes then there. We'll see what the Senate comes out with. Uh, I know there's still discussions. And again, we're going through a healthy process of discussion, uh, both at the House and Senate before a final bill gets to the president's desk. Now, Secretary, a moment ago you said, look, the people in this room, the people in New York, you know, they're, they're not necessarily going to be you know, impacted so much, even if taxes go higher for them. But I want to ask you about this, and I know you've heard me ask this question a lot. If you're looking at the number of taxpayers, the, in the high 10% the high of the highest earners are paying 70% of the tax. Doesn't it make more sense to cut taxes on those who are paying taxes rather than people who are not paying taxes? 50% of the people do not pay taxes. So are you cutting taxes on the people who actually pay taxes with this plan? Again, if you, you look at the plan, and let's just start with what has been the president's objective from day one. The two objectives have been middle income tax cuts and make our business tax system competitive. That's really what we've been focused on. And, and I think the current bill in the House and the bill that's going to come out of the Senate meet those objectives. And that, that's what's critical. So, you know, people who make over a million dollars, there's going to be plenty of other benefits. There's changes to the estate tax. Again, fundamentally, Republicans believe in getting rid of the estate tax because it's a double tax. You've already paid taxes. Um, we'll see where the Senate comes out, but I expect there'll be some changes to the current system in the Senate version. Um, I heard the Senate doesn't want the estate tax. Well, again, I'm not going to comment on what they're going to come out with in advance. Okay. Uh, but uh, we can talk about that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So continue. You, you were so I, I think, you know, the bills are meeting the objective, and I think that's crit what's critical. I only ask because I feel like for so many years I've been hearing about trickle-down economics. You create an environment for the job creators, you create an environment for the highest earners, and they will turn around and put that money to work and it trickles down. Do you still believe in trickle-down economics? Uh, I, I do. And again, I think one of the big incentives on the corporate rate is at a 20% rate, companies are going to be incented to reinvest those profits as opposed to dividending them out. I mean, that, that's an enormous impact. When you look at the business side of this, which is a 20% rate, uh, a discounted rate for pass-throughs, automatic expensing for five years, that's going to be make our businesses very, very competitive. And I think that's going to be great for the economy. I want to ask you a question from the audience. Uh, it's a new, news, uh, newsworthy question, because we know that the president has rolled back so many regulations. And he is actually the least regulatory president that we've seen in some time, cutting federal pages by more than 30 percent. But now there's this talk about AT&T Time Warner and perhaps uh, forcing this company to sell CNN and the Turner Broadcasting business uh, as a way to allow this to pass. If he's trying to cut regulations, why is the DOJ getting heavier hand with that deal? Well, Maria, I think it would be inappropriate for me to comment on the specifics of that, because that is being handled by the Justice Department as an antitrust issue. That's not a regulatory issue, and I'm not going to comment on the specifics of that. Um, but what I would say is President Trump, you know, this is the greatest move in regulation since Ronald Reagan. And we are committed for every one new regulation. We get rid of two regulations. We've already done a lot in uh, the financial area. We're working on the energy area. I mean, as again, as, as we travel during the campaign, businesses were as much concerned about regulations as they were about taxes. We've talked in the past about the government-sponsored entities, the GSEs like Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac, and what went on under the Obama administration where they actually took money from those companies and used it for other things. Is that true? It is. And, and, and what is your intent with these government-sponsored entities? 
So, uh, you know, I've been involved in the housing market for over 30 years and specifically uh, involved with understanding Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So these are something I have a lot of experience. And as I said, when I was confirmed, um, I am determined that we have housing reform and that we come up with a permanent solution for Fannie and Freddie so that uh, they're not in the current form, which is effectively owned by the government, having a massive line of credit with the Treasury and uh, you know, the Treasury being compensated through dividends. We need to fix the housing system. So that's something that I'll be working on, uh, will be a big priority for next year. And when, when I say housing reform, we're gonna look at both FHA and Ginnie Mae, where the government has a lot of exposure as well. We want to make sure that we don't fix Fannie and Freddie, only to find out that the government has a lot of risk through FHA. People are wondering why these companies are still paying dividends. Um, they're, they're, they're paying dividends out of their earnings. Is that appropriate? Have you considered stopping the dividends? Uh, I have not considered that. Matter of fact, there have been discussions about the dividends, and uh, I've, I've told the director that we expect, the Treasury expects to get the dividends and expects to be compensated. Right now, the taxpayers have a very large exposure. These companies couldn't exist without that, and that's why we're being paid the dividends. But having said that, we want a permanent solution. Um, we're not looking at keeping these the way they are for the next eight years, the way the Obama administration did, and used the money, as you said, for other things. So we should be expecting change in that? With the, in Absolutely. And, and that, I expect, is something that we'll be doing on a bipartisan basis. I think there's a lot of interest on both sides, uh, and that'll be a big focus. We've already had a bunch of preliminary conversations with the House and Senate on it, but that'll be a big focus of mine for next year. Speaking of bipartisanship, are you expecting any Democratic vo Democrats to vote yes to the tax bill, and do you have the votes to get this thing passed? So the answer is, I think we will have Democrats. Uh, the President has invited Democrats to come for his speeches. We've had Democrats on Air Force One. We've had them come join the President. Uh, we've had discussions with Democrats. I actually just got on the, off the phone on, on the way here. So we hope there's Democratic support. I mean, I would say again, on the business side and the middle income tax cuts, that's something that I believe is not a Republican versus Democrat issue, is something that both parties understand. There's a conversation taking place that the other night where we saw victories uh, almost across the board for Democrats, whether it be New Jersey or Virginia or here in New York City, that the Republicans aren't saying, oh God, tax reform is, is more critical than ever before, otherwise we're gonna lose the 2018 midterms coming up next year. How did you feel when you saw the victories the other night uh, from the other side? Again, I, I, I separate these, the issues. I don't, I don't feel any differently before the elections as after the elections. Tax reform is critical for the economy. It's something that President Trump campaigned on. Um, it's something that the market expects. Uh, it's, it's critical, and I think that the Republicans understand that, and hopefully we'll get Democrats who understand that as well. Secretary, you've been also working on sanctions. Obviously, the threats to the United States have gone up whether it's North Korea, Iran, we've got issues around Russia. Tell me why sanctions are important to you and why you think they work. Because some people say sanctions don't work. North Korea does not care about its people. Kim Jong-un uh, does not care about his people. What does he care about sanctions? So Maria, that's, that's a good question. And you know, it's interesting, most people don't realize that a major part of my job is managing the sanctions programs. I probably spend 50% of my time on this and on foreign policy issues. And uh, I, I can 100% assure you that they do work, that the President thinks they work, that uh, the Secretary of State, Mattis and I, uh, the intelligence community, we all work together. There's no question in the case of Iran that the only reason they came to the table to negotiate the JCPOA was because of the sanctions that were in place. And we fundamentally believe there could have been a better deal we're very concerned about the term of the Iran nuclear deal. We're very concerned about the ballistic missile activity and uh, the terrorism that they're doing outside of the deal. Um, I just got back from a trip to the Middle East where I visited Saudi Arabia. We, we launched the terrorist financing targeting center actually in Saudi with 
several other uh, countries in the region. I then went on to Israel, UAE, and Qatar. In every single country, uh, there was common views on what we're doing to combat terrorist financing, and specifically Iran. So there's no question these sanctions work, whether it's Iran, North Korea, they have worked. Um, obviously, uh, I, I didn't go on the president's foreign trip because I'm here focused on tax reform, but there's no question uh, the president has given me very significant authorities to sanction anybody that does trade or other significant activity with North Korea, um, and these things work. Are you expecting to insert more sanctions on Chinese banks, for example? Uh, again, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on that specifically, but I can tell you the president is having very specific conversations with President Xi about North Korea, and we appreciate the way they're working with us. In, in terms of Saudi Arabia, I too was in Saudi Arabia, and I saw you there, and it was extraordinary. When I got home, there was this incredible coup, putting uh, with the crown prince uh, jailing 11 princesses and ministers over corruption and other things. What's your take on that? What, what's going on in Saudi Arabia? They're freezing $800 billion in, in money. Well, Marie, I don't think a coup is, the, is, is a fair or, or appropriate description. I think, as you know, uh, the crown prince uh, is very determined to move Saudi Arabia forward in, in a very significant way. I mean, the statistic that I was blown away by is 70% of the population is 30 years or younger. That's incredible. And I think, as you know, I mean, many of the people in this audience were actually in Saudi with me. I think it was uh, dubbed, what was it, Davos in the Desert. Davos in the Desert. Okay. <laughs> I think there was $20 trillion of assets under management that was represented there. Um, the Crown Prince is, is moving very aggressively to get the country back to moderate Islam and move the country and create jobs for people. I think he understands that if he doesn't create jobs for these people under 30, it's, it's gonna be a real problem. Now, I can't comment the, the arrests and house arrests, and as you said, uh, we, they're now being held in the beautiful hotel that uh, we, we had the opportunity to stay on. Exactly. Um, I'm not, uh, you know, I don't know what the specifics of the corruption charges are. I know they've said that there's gonna be a fair process on this, but uh, it, it, it's not a coup. Let me, let me ask you this. I want to get back to domestic issues here because obviously we just saw the passage of, of the budget, budget, the vote on the budget, and um, a lot of people are saying, look, half a trillion dollars in overspending on the budget this year, or 18, another half a trillion overspending in 19. I recognize we're pushing you on salt, we're pushing you on, on these things that, that makes the tax bill more expensive, but when does budget issues, debt, $20 trillion in debt, become a near-term priority? You've said growth is your priority right now, but when does getting our arms around the debt become a priority, given the overspending, and we know that that means attacking the entitlements? Well, it, the debt is concerning, so let me, let me first say, the fact that we've gone from $10 trillion of debt to $20 trillion of debt in the last eight years, that, that's quite concerning. And there are issues we're gonna need to focus on so that the debt doesn't just continue to grow. I think the first issue is we do have to have economic growth. That's probably the best way of dealing with this. And that's something that we're very focused on. But uh, you know, the debt is something, obviously, debt ceilings, things like that, another part of my job. W will, will there be a focus on entitlements, reining in the entitlements before they go broke? Um, entitlements is not our focus at the moment. Our focus right now is on growth. Our focus is also on the military, making sure that uh, the military has the proper amount of funding. It's interesting, I just got back from the Reagan Library, and again, that's obviously something President Reagan, big part of, of his policy. Um, we have some very serious issues throughout the world, and uh, our, our men and women in the military are making great sacrifices to protect us. We need to make sure they have the right equipment. By the way, at a time that we've got a very aging fleet in the Navy and aging equipment, I recognize that in terms of the need to modernize. Final question here, Secretary, how would you characterize the economy right now? We just saw two quarters of 3% growth. Can you identify for us where the growth is happening today? Well, I think you're seeing across the board, and I, I think you see this both in, in the growth in the numbers, you also see this in the, the market. But uh, you know, I think this is a big vote of confidence in our economic plans, and now we need to deliver. We need to deliver on tax reform, regulatory relief, and 
then renegotiate some trade deals. We look forward to that. Secretary Thank Mnuchin, you, good Maria. to see you. Thank you so much, Stephen Mnuchin. We understand Secretary Mnuchin, he's on a very tight schedule, cannot stay for lunch, but thank you again, Secretary, for being here. Please give him another round of applause, please. As a reminder, the next meeting of the club will be a luncheon on November 15th with Ginny Rometty, Chairman, President, and CEO of IBM. The next event following that will be a luncheon on November 21st with Doug McMillan, President and CEO of Walmart followed on November 29th by a luncheon with Randall Stevenson, Chairman and CEO of AT&T. And then on December 5th, we will have a dinner with Henry Kissinger, Chairman of Kissinger Associates Incorporated. Thank you once again, everyone, for joining us today, and please enjoy your lunch. Thank you.